on October 7th, October 8th, October 9th, October 10th, the first, let's say, week or so, people who you'd never imagine would be condemning Hamas were doing that. But then, as Israel started retaliating, that's when people started getting um, triggered and pulled back to their natural, you know, it was like a reset button. They kind of get like, go back to system restore to where they were before October 7th. What does that do for you and your friendships with them? I was in a place where I thought that we're heading in the right direction. And for a long time, there hadn't been any serious terror incidents anywhere. And it kind of felt like, you know, the world is moving along this path towards coexistence, togetherness, unity, peace, whatever you want to call it. And things really looked optimistic. And I was already thinking to myself, like, you know, I put a lot of work into what I can do to show the Muslim community who we are. I also tried to show some aspects of nice Muslims who I met to our community. And I thought like, okay, this is a chapter that's going to be closing because we're heading in the right direction. And any day, peace with Saudi Arabia would finish everything. They essentially are the most powerful country in the Arab world. And once that happens, then everyone else comes along and gets on the boat. And then October 7th happened and the whole dream, it wasn't just my dream, it was the dream of a lot of people, was shattered and we're back to the drawing board. Even for some of your friends who are Muslim, I imagine. Sure. They felt like, this. well, man, we, we were so close. Some of them did. Have some, they, they expressed that to you? Some have. Some have uh, been very disappointing, to say the least. What does that disappointment look like? Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Meaningful People podcast. So happy you clicked on this episode with my friend, Shlaimi Zients. And uh, this is actually a second time ever on Meaningful People. And there's so much to discuss. Shlaimi is very involved in the Muslim world. A lot of relationships in Dubai, in Pakistan. And we discuss sort of what that's like post October 7th with him. And we also discuss, you know, Shlaimi looks Jewish. I mean, a lot of us do, but Shlaimi travels the world and he does not hide his Yiddishkeit. And we discussed that as well, how strong of a message that is and what he's doing right now to make sure that you and your kids don't hide it either. Um, this is a family-friendly episode. You can listen with your kids in the car. Uh, it's, it's, it's kosher. It's kosher. It's, it's good. So uh, give it a listen. And we're, we'll be giving away some merch. So go ahead and leave a comment on this video. Like, comment, subscribe. We'll be picking one lucky winner down below to get merch. What merch? Well, you'll see at the end of the episode. So um, make sure to comment, like, and subscribe to enter a giveaway for some candle and strap merch. I want to give a big thank you to my friends at Ceremian, who, uh, come on, you know Ceremian. That is Moshe Alpert from Alpert and Associates, now known as Ceremian. You're looking at this calendar and Purim and Pesach are coming up. And those are stressful times in terms of budgeting. What do we spend on costumes? Shalach Manos, the Suda, uh, Pesach. What's, how many people are we inviting? So many questions come up and you really want to have those answers. It starts today. It starts today. It starts today by making this call, 718-644-1594. Call Moshe Alpert from Ceremian, from Alpert Associates, and have a consultation. Speak about what he can do for you financially, how he can guide you. You don't need to stress. You just need a plan. And that is what you'll get at Ceremian. Besides for needing a financial plan, you need, you need a plan with the kids because sometimes they're off from school and that's why you want to go to 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 Tovido. Go to Tovido.com. Who needs cocoa melon when you have the Pintalach or when you have Kiwi and Tuki, when you have the Talking Coins, when you have Mendy Music, when you have McGillis Lester, I can keep going on. There's over 800 videos on Tovido.com. Don't leave your kid in front of YouTube, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu. Don't. It's not worth it. Get to Vito right now. Use promo code MM10 for a 10% discount at checkout. MM10. I you go on their website. There's so much. Even before even purchasing your subscription, go on their website, tovito.com, hit see videos and go through. Your kid will love it. There's so many options for all different ages, boys and girls. Tovito.com is the place where you want to go. And just in case you may be looking for a new community to move to Providence, Rhode Island. What? So you already got your financial planning. Your kids are taken care of because they're watching Tevito and you guys like, you're like, all right, we got to move. We're going to move to Providence, Rhode Island. Well, Providence, Rhode Island is becoming a very, very hot place to move right now. 
It's near major cities like New York and Boston. Providence itself is offering a lot. Right now, there's a free 50K and a first year tuition offer on the table, $50,000 towards a house purchase and first year free tuition. Okay. So these are things that you want to think about. They have great education. They have mikvahs. They have kosher food, life. There's life in the community. There's life at the shul. It's a growing community. If you want to be a yachid, if you want to be someone that helps grow a community, then you should look into Jewish Providence. Dot com. Think about Providence, Rhode Island. Now enjoy this episode of Shlomi Zions. You are listening to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast featuring our nation's most impactful, influential, and meaningful people. Going into airplane mode, sitting here in the studio. I will be in touch with you when we're done. Thank you. Bye. You're now free thrown by the cabin. So, please exercise caution while opening overhead compartments while baggage may have shifted during takeoff and landing. You love that. You love that. You love planes. <laughs> you guys, both of you, you fly a lot. Not as much as you, dude. You never know. How, have you been on a plane since uh, the new year started? Since this year? Yeah. No. I have, and I never fly. Right. Naki, did, we're going to talk about this on the podcast. Oh, my gosh. Do you see that? Wait a minute. Of yeah. course I have. I you was have? in Florida. Since when? when? Tw- like in 2024? Yeah. Not Rosh yeah. Hashanah. No, no, after New Year's. I'm going to be on my seventh flight tomorrow for 2024. Well, you're on pace for how many this year? Well, if, if it continues at this rate, it could be 150, 200. Is that what you want to do? I don't really care. It's not like the goal is not to fly. The goal is to do important Destination. Like, I heard, things. I heard Ali Bear is on the road over 200 days a year. That makes, that makes over sense. Over 200 days a year. I can't even. I, I wouldn't be able to do 20. It's not for everyone. It isn't, <laughs> but it's for you. So far, it has been. We'll see what. How happens. do you always get to the, the exit row? Um, so it has to do with my status. Okay. When I don't get upgraded to business class, I take the exit, the exit row seat for myself, which gives me room. And also, if the door flies open while you're Alaska Air, how you, are you? Yeah, so you're the first one. Marshall. No, you you. Are you no, no, I heard about this one. Uh, he's a, he's... Nah, he's usually my source for news. Momo when usually, something very important happens, Naki makes sure to inform me because he knows otherwise I'm at risk of not finding out. Momo doesn't have WhatsApp. Yeah. Right. I heard about this last night. I was listening to the interview with Naki's father. Yeah. And <laughs> I was like, guy. that's impressive. No WhatsApp. It's been a while. From what I understand, going off of WhatsApp today would be like a much different decision. But it's been... It's like going off of like heavy drugs. Yeah, like it would be a much more drastic decision to go off of WhatsApp today if like if you're on WhatsApp, like if you're alive basically. But um yeah, it's been many years, so. Do you, did you see First of all, I didn't know they let Jews in business class. That's good to know. Yes, United <laughs> does. <laughs> Cuz Cause, cause from like the replies to some of your tweets, I'm surprised they let you on the plane. Like that's that's pretty cool. Um but People are, are maybe wondering, oh, we had Shlem- the Shlemy was on this podcast a few years ago, and now we have him back. So, like, obviously, we're not going to delve into your whole life story. You know, we, we people know you. You write Navi Magazine for many years. You travel the world. Uh, you're, like, 25% Muslim. Uh, Erroneous! <laughs> no, you're not. But you have a very close relationship with a lot of Muslims. Yeah. And this is something that I haven't spoken to you about um, last time you were on. And I think it's, it's, it's definitely an appropriate place, perhaps, to start this time. I wonder how your relationships look post October 7th when it comes to uh, the Islamic world. So that's a very good question. I'm going to just make a bracha. Sure. Don't say I mean anybody. Right? Oh, right. Because you're not. Yeah, you're not supposed to. Yeah. And I'm, I'm that guy. I know one halacha. I got you. I'm going to object to the voice of halacha that you just put on. <laughs> What was that voice? It was a seventh grade Rebbe. It's fine. Do you know what I mean, though? Yeah. We were actually talking about that water right before you sat down. What were you saying? We were talking about the bottle. Right. Yes. Yes. And Shlemy was considerate to pour the water out of the bottle into the cup. And he commented Yeah. that it uh, looks like everyone's drinking from cups instead of bottles. And we both remembered the same factoid from Ramosha Reichman, Shkana Lavracha. Toronto. You want to say it? You can say it. You probably know it better than me. I don't know. I just, I, I read it in the, in the book that Sterling Besser wrote that he was mocked at all of his life not to drink from a bottle. And at, towards the end of his life, he was in a hospital and they brought him a bottle of water. And it was really like in the final days of his life. 
and they brought him this bottle of water to drink from and he just refused and he said, it doesn't matter what condition I'm in, where I'm at, what's going on. I don't drink from a bottle. I never did. And I learned it from, I was in a yeshiva, Rabbi Sachar Blinder was one of the Rosh Hashivas there. And he got up there on the first day of yeshiva and he said, there's only one rule in the yeshiva. One rule. You do not drink out of a bottle. Wow. <laughs> wow. And, and like, that was it. I swear to God. Like one rule, you do not drink out of a bottle. And if you drink out of, if you drink out of a bottle, he'd really get upset at you. What are you, an animal? Like, drink out of a cup, like a mensch. I kind of wish that I had been in a yeshiva where that was the only rule. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> but when that's the only rule, right, the pshat is that it's the rule that governs everything that goes on. It's, it's like, it's like the genie saying, anything. what do you want to wish for? I wish for a million wishes. So that rule, it, it's basically be a be mensch. A but it's more than that, because if that is the rule, then you know that anything that is any less mensch like is automatically exactly. off the table. Exactly, exactly, exactly. As Momo likes to say, um, interesting. Um, Close parentheses on the bottle of water. <laughs> so yeah, Muslims, Muslims, Arabs, Arabs. A very large population of the world yes. is, uh, you know, they're big in numbers. I think there's about two billion of them. Crazy in the world. Um, it's not our, so crazy. Our cousins. They're, they are our cousins. Um, family. As much as we might not feel that way or see it that way, but that's that's what it is. And when I grew up, I mean, I was terrified of Muslim people and of Arab people. I, I, don't, I don't think it's fair to say that our community is Islamophobic because... We don't know enough, we don't know enough to be Islamophobic. Yeah, we, never, we don't have them in our lives. Like, it's just this other community that we don't know anything about. And that's the way my life was until I started traveling. I got to know some very nice Muslim people and it changed the way I thought about them. At the same time, there are also people who identify as Muslims who do some things that cause the fear that we have of that group and pre-october 7th we were living in a shall we say a jewish muslim relations dreamland like things were really going well things were nice there were incredible things happening in dubai other countries in the gulf even in israel things were in a pretty good state and then everything everything just fell apart like october 7th messed everything up israel was so close to a peace deal with Saudi Arabia for the first time. The Saudi crown prince acknowledged it publicly. And now, uh, who knows? Have you spoken to those, those contacts, those friends? I know you've gone to Dubai and you've been to other, you know, other countries and you, and you spent time with them, maybe even stayed with them. Have you spoken to them post-October 7th? What's, what's that like? like what's the, the chemistry like after such an event? So when you say them, there's, there's many thems. There are people right. who I'm in touch with on a regular basis. There are people who I'm not in touch with at all. There are people who I thought were seeing the situation the same way I saw it, and it turns out they see it very differently. There are people who I thought might see the situation differently, but they see it the same way as I see it. it there's no like one way that it's going, but there are some people who have been incredible. Like There's a guy named Amjad Taha. He's on Twitter, and he is the strongest supporter of the Jewish people, the strongest supporter of Israel, much stronger than most of the Jewish people we're seeing supporting Israel. And then there are other people who I know personally who uh, don't have the same views. And one of the things that I've always tried to do, especially in the Arab world, was when I'm traveling, I know that I know where I grew up. I know the mindset that I grew up with. And I know that I am conditioned to see things this way because this is where I grew up. So what I always try to do is let me see if I can see things the other way. Let me try to put myself in his mind and their mind to see the way they would see something. And when you do that, it's, it's weird, but you can also identify with issues that they take very seriously. And you're like, yeah, you know, that, that bothers me too. Like, for example, any Arab person, when they are seeing what's happening in Gaza and a lot of, you know, people are dying, that they get triggered. Right. I get triggered too. Do you? I do. When you, now, see, when you see this current crisis and you see those, the videos of Israel striking targets in, in Gaza. So the striking doesn't trigger me. It's the aftermath that I, I, at the end of the day, there are people dying and it, they're human beings. Hashem created them. And it's hard for me to see it. How Israel can respond differently, differently I don't know. I don't know that there's something different they can do. Can so I open up parentheses? I want to commend the two of you. I've been like listening to yeah. that dialogue. We started referring to what happened on Simchus Terror this year. We started referring to it as October 7th. Yeah. And that became like a, 
It's like a flagpole. Like yeah, like 9-11. Yeah. It as a date. Yeah. And then as we get deeper into the conversation, I noticed a shift where you started referring to it as the situation, the current crisis, the climate, and it starts taking on more of a meaning of what actually occurred on that day. And I hope, you know, we talk a lot about how do we hold on to whatever inspiration or whatever meaning is introduced as a result of something. How do we hold on to that? How do we make sure that it's not fleeting? And I think it's subtle, but I think even just referring to it as October 7th, just giving it that little label, that little date, devoid of any sensitivity, devoid of any meaning or pain or significance, I think that's part of what makes it more difficult. You see, she's saying is if she, people, it's, it's, it's disrespectful to, not disrespectful, but it's not the best to refer to it as October 7th. I, I, think, I, I think there are more meaningful ways to refer to what happened the on Simcha Star than as just October 7th. But let's, let's dive into that for a second. Why, why is it that this is just, like, how do people refer to it October 7th? What happened on October 7th? Was it a mass terror attack? Was it a mass rape? Was it a mass shooting? Was it a mass kidnapping? It was all those things. But because it was so great in magnitude, it, no one knows how to process this. So it mm -hmm. just becomes October 7th. There right. are not many dates like this in, in history. You have September 11th. Everyone knows where they were when it happened, what happened that sure, day. What there was so it. much going on. That's why it's, it's called by that date. You know, in India, they had a massive terror attack in Mumbai in 2008, and they called it 2611. It was November 26th, and it's 2611, because essentially what the date signifies is this is the day that we realized that things will never be the same. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that it's insensitive. It's just what so much happened on that day that I don't know there's a different way to classify it other um, than the yeah, date. I might agree with you on that. What do you think, Momo? So... I was just uh, I was just pointing out an observation. What happened was you started referring to it as October 7th, and then as we started unpacking the events, the atrocities of that day, you started ascribing so different eventually. different terms to that day, and you're absolutely right. There's no way we could talk about it for 6 hours every time we refer to it, we still won't be able to capture the extent of the atrocities that that occurred and the magnitude and the scope and everything that happened. It's impossible. Yeah. I just hope that when we do refer to it, we don't apply an insensitive label to it. And if if the way you just described it, giving it just the date actually amplifies the magnitude, that, that the day alone is enough by just referring to the date, that alone is so significant that what else happened on October 7th? Nothing. Like that is October 7th. And maybe it couldn't represent the gravity and the significance of the day. But let it do that. Right. And let it not just be a cold, insensitive label. Sure. Amen. So October 7th, for me personally, I was in Russia, in Rostov when it happened. And I remember that it was like Yom Tov was almost over and I had all these plans of all the things that I was going to do this year and the places I was going to travel to. And October 7th just came in. Nothing is the same. Whole life changed. I was messed up for a long time. Like for the first 10 days, I didn't even know like what's right, what's left. And slowly, I, feel, I, th I don't think it's just me. I think a lot of people are feeling this. Like we're recalibrating, figuring out, okay, so this is something that happened. I don't want to sound like Ilhan Omar, you know, some people did something. Yeah. It was October 7th. It was a day where nothing else is significant anymore, aside from the fact that it was Yom Tov. What else happened in the world it does not matter. That was a day that changed for every single person in Klai And now we're trying to get our way back to what was before and we have to figure out what comes after and part of that is dealing with our neighbors and our cousins who very much live in the same universe as us and they're not going anywhere and we're not going anywhere and we have to figure out how to you know coexist. i imagine it, i imagine you might have experienced this confusion and this just this craziness maybe uniquely in a unique way where the vast majority of Klal Yisrael doesn't yeah. have a whole lot of exposure, doesn't have a whole lot of, all, yeah. of ongoing relations with anyone that is Arab, with anyone that is Muslim. I think that anyone that does is an exception to the rule. And therefore, with all of that pre, all of that experience that you had leading up to this Yom Tif, you have a context in which to 
try to process this in a way that very few people do. In a way, I feel like it's harder for me to process because I was in a place where I thought that we're heading in the right direction. And for a long time, there hadn't been any serious terror incidents anywhere. And it kind of felt like, you know, the world is moving along this path towards coexistence, togetherness, unity, peace, whatever you want to call it. And things really looked optimistic. And I was already thinking to myself, like, you know, I put a lot of work into what I can do to show the Muslim community who we are. I also tried to show some aspects of nice Muslims who I met to our community. And I thought like, okay, this is a chapter that's going to be closing because we're heading in the right direction. And any day, peace with Saudi Arabia would finish everything. They essentially are the most powerful country in the Arab world. And once that happens, then everyone else comes along and gets on the boat. And then October 7th happened, and the whole dream, it wasn't just my dream, it was the dream of a lot of people, was shattered, and we're back to the drawing board. Even for some of your friends who are Muslim, I imagine. Sure. They felt like, this. well, man, we, we were so close. Some of them did. Some, they, they expressed that to you? Some have. Some have uh, been very disappointing, to say the least. What does a disappointment look like? The disappointment looks like I thought we were on the same page. I thought we understood that there are definitely issues in the Middle East around Israel and Gaza, right? There, I, there's definitely things that can be done better, and I thought we understood how things get better. I thought you understood that if terrorism continues, there can be no peace. And then all of a sudden, October 7th happens, and people are on a side that I did not expect them to be on. Now, I understand yeah. why naturally they'd be inclined to be on that side. I don't. You understand that? Well, why, why would they be naturally be inclined so, to be on that so side? So you have to understand, again, if I grew up in the firm community and I see things my way, someone grew up in the Arab community and in their community, the Palestinians are the people who we have to have mercy on and you know help them because they're occupied and whatever. You have to understand why a person is more inclined to be on that side. Having said that, after October 7th, if you saw what the... Palestinian terrorists of Hamas did, it's very clear that you can't be on that side. But why people are pulled there and, and why I understand, I see, and I'm not justifying what they did, God forbid. I'm just, I'm able to understand why they are more inclined to be on that side than on our side. Am I, am I, do I sound crazy? I don't think you sound crazy. I mean, Momo? I, I would hope that these Muslim friends of yours um, who are people who want peace October 7th happens, I would hope that they would quickly be able to be on the right side of history. Right. So for the most part, on October 7th, October 8th, October 9th, October 10th, the first, let's say, week or so, things were pretty good. Like any legitimacy that Hamas had ever in the outside world was gone. People who you'd never imagine would be condemning Hamas were doing that. But then, as Israel started retaliating, that's when people started getting um, triggered and pulled back to their natural, you know, it was like a reset button. They kind of get like, go back to system restore to where they were before October 7th. What does that do for you and your friendships with them? So there's a lot of people who I'm not really close with anymore. Um, this is a question that's been in my life for a long time. Like, can you have a relationship with somebody who not only doesn't see the same way as you, but also kind of is siding with people who want to see you dead, right? So, seems like an insurmountable challenge. Yeah, <laughs> for yes. a functional relationship. <laughs> Correct. Just so, the murderous <laughs> desire. So seems insurmountable. So again, these are. I don't know that I have a relationship with anybody who personally wants me dead, but I have relationships with people who have relationships with people who want me dead. And that's weird. Yeah. And there's always this fine line of trying to figure out, well, is there anything here? Like, is there a reason this relationship could continue? Is there any way that somehow... Well, not with you alive. Yeah. No, I, I would like to think that we, it can continue with me alive and maybe when the dust settles things can get better and you can say, well, this is really not cool that you were supporting people who tried to kill me. Or sometimes you just have to cut someone out of your life. Let me ask you a question. The Why balance is, is trying to figure out when, when to do that and when to do the other thing. Right. And when, when I heard you describe 
that this dream, and maybe in today's day and age we would refer to it as a fantasy, of this like world peace that would occur before the Mohammed's Gaigu Magag, right? Before this light of Mashiach reveals itself. Or maybe that is the light of Mashiach revealing itself. Right? Perhaps. Agreed. But for, for us, for, for mankind through our human relations, through our political and diplomatic relations, for us to achieve this fantastic, Milosian fantasy, this fantastic peace, I heard you describe that dream as shattered. Yes. And I think the way you just described the, the insurmountable hurdles to a human functional relationship, I see that as that dream shattered. Yeah. I don't see a, a way in which diplomatic peace can be achieved by yadi through our own just capacity for negotiation without Hashem revealing the ultimate truth. The light of Mashiach. Sure, but just to be clear, there's not like I have some kind of seat at the diplomatic table where I'm able to uh, make peace deals, not make peace deals. My relationships are more like, listen, I'm here, I'm a member of the Jewish community, I've come to your country to get to know you, I come with love and with peace and with friendship, and I hope that somehow we can use our relationship to bring about a bond between our two people and see, we're obviously not going to see everything on the same page, but let's see what we can find that we can see on the same page, and maybe we can work from there. And since October 7th, let's just say there has not been a lot of that going on. We'll be back to this exciting conversation with Shlemy Zions. But first, a word for my friends at Success Events. I'm going to be at this. It is an amazing business summit. Uh, you want to elevate your business. You want to meet a lot of people that would be very, very hard to reach on the phone. Not me, of course. I, I'm very reachable on the phone, right? Right, guys? You know that. But... There'll be Shlemy Zients, Shmuel Reichman, Bob Berg, Nassan Gantz, Chayla Kaufman, Charlene Amanoff, Joe Applebaum, myself, I will be there. It's going to be an event that you don't want to miss, and it's taking place on Monday, February 19th from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. in Teaneck, New Jersey. Go ahead and head to success events with a Z, events with a Z. Dot com. That's successevents.com. Secure a spot. Be ready to boost your sales and marketing strategies like never before. You're going to love it. Um, if you have any questions, you can call them at 305-520-7493. Uh, the, the link is in the show notes in the description. So I hope to see you there at the SMB Sales and Marketing Summit. Uh, of course, I will be there. And I will be wearing a Collars & Co. shirt because it's just that time of year where it's a little cold or freezing, depending where you are. And I want to wear a sweater or I want to wear a sweatshirt, but I also want to look like a professional. I'm like right now, obviously. So what do I wear? You wear a Collars & Co. shirt underneath because comfort is, is important. Just as important as looking good, to be honest. So what do I do? I put on my Collars & Co. and then I put on a nice sweater, a nice cardigan. And underneath, I'm, I'm a short sleeve guy, three buttons, but it looks like a beautiful regular shirt. It is amazing. Or for Shabbos, I wear the Collars & Co. Quadruplex shirt. It is a full button down, full sleeve I love the product and I think you will too. So head to collarsandco.com, use promo code MEANINGFUL for 15% off your order right now. That is promo code MEANINGFUL for 15% off. You're going to like the way you look. That is a slogan I stole from a different store. I hope they're not watching, but you're going to like the way you look when you wear Collars and Co. Now back to this episode. But that, that role that you describe is a role that always existed and, mm. and is a role that's yeah. as important as ever to be a Arla Goyim, to be a light onto the nations and to provide visibility into the outside world. This is what it means to be a Jew. You, you, are you curious? What is it like to live a Jewish life? This is what it looks like. And look how beautiful and look how full of light that is. And I see you on the forefront of, of doing that on a daily basis. I'm trying. Before and today. Well, thank you. I, I am trying. But, you know, after October 7th, I was like so shattered. It wasn't just the dream that was shattered. I was shattered because I felt like any work that I had put into this over the past five years was literally a waste of time. And slowly I started to put, the, to put together the pieces again. And one of the things that I, I wasn't sure if I should do was, should I visit Eretz Israel? Should I visit Israel or not? It felt like a scary time to go. Um, it felt like facing fears that I would, had been running away from. And I decided to get on the plane and go. And when I went there, it gave me, once again, 
the feeling, the fantasy, the dream came back. Mm. Because there I saw a country where actually there are Jewish people living. It's, it's the Jewish land. It's a Jewish country. The Jews are pretty much running the place. But they have some Arabs in the Knesset. And Arab women were going shopping on Yafo Street. And in Israel, during the war that the whole world is talking about, you know, Israel is killing the Arabs and killing the Palestinians. It's apartheid state and all this nonsense. And then you go to Israel and you see that the one place in the Middle East where this is actually happening, where the dream is alive, is in Israel. And going there rekindled in me the dream and I realized that it is still possible. How we get back there, how we build up what we had before October 7th, I have no idea. But there's never been a more important time to work on it than there is now. Well, it seems like that, for you at least, uh, that battle or, or that, that job begins on, on social media. Obviously, you're a big YouTuber, um, vlogger. Let's talk about everyone who's watching this knows. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. You are on a plane and you, you take a selfie by your seat and you post to Twitter. And I don't have my phone on me, so I can't say the exact lushion of what you posted, but you along the lines of no anti-Semite's gonna make me not look Jewish on this flight, or no one's gonna no one's gonna stop me. And then all of a sudden that tweet, well, it has 20 million, 15, 15, 14 million. 14 million people wow. uh, you know, saw that tweet. And I would say there's tens of thousands of interactions with it, many of which are are very disheartening, to yeah. say the least. Um to talk about that experience, I, I imagine you did not, in your wildest dreams, imagine that would happen. Okay. So, Srilly? <laughs> that wasn't a mistake. No, I'm sorry. You don't get a Srilly for that. <laughs> Mazel tov to Srilly, You have to earn yeah. the Srilly. Srilly is a chassan. Mazel tov Srilly. Which Srilly. camera? No. Mazel tov Srilly. Yes. Mazel tov to Srilly's kala as well. After October 7th, I found myself, immediately after, I, I found myself in Turkey. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, found yourself in Turkey? I, well, I had been in Russia, and because of the situation, you can't just fly from the United States to Russia anymore, okay. like the good old days. So you have to fly to Turkey, and then from there, you get back to the United States. I got stuck in Turkey, a whole story. I missed my flight, lost my tefillin. I found them, Baruch Hashem. Wild Turkey. And uh, there was an issue in Turkey at that time, and, and still now, with the visibility that people did not feel comfortable walking around openly as Jews. Fair. And, and it did not just uh, occur in Turkey. It's actually happening all over the world. And if I may say so myself, we are living through a Jewish identity crisis or a Jewish pride crisis. Mm. There's a problem right now because of all the anti-Semitism, which was sparked by the Israel's retaliation of what happened on October 7th. And I should, I should say, you know what? It's not, it wasn't really sparked by the retaliation because anti-Semitism has been here forever. Right. But things really rekindled, uh, you know, were ramped up very quickly. And at this point, we're in a situation where a lot of people don't feel comfortable walking around comfortably as a Jew. They don't feel comfortable identifying proudly as a Jew, dressing as a Jew when they go out into the city or into an airport. They just feel like something bad might happen. And when I was flying to Israel, I was, it was a morning flight and I had to daven in the airport. And I was trying to find a quiet corner for myself. And then I thought to myself, like, why am I hiding? What am I doing? So I daven publicly. And then after davening, I took a short video of myself and I just basically said I'm here in the airport I wasn't sure where I should dive and I was uncomfortable I decided to dive in publicly I got some dirty looks I don't care I'm Jewish I'm not giving it away I'm not giving it up this is what it is and uh, you know that's what I'm going to do so I posted the video online a lot of people saw it um, got a lot of feedback people were like we need more of this like this is a problem and I started to think back to when I was a kid and all sorts of experiences that I had growing up I remember like walking to shul with my father on Shabbos and a car would pass by and people would yell like dirty Jew. Where would you go? Up? In Toronto. In Toronto, okay. Or like Hitler didn't finish his job, that kind of stuff. And I remember there was one incident which really bothered me. You were the subject of that of that anti Semitism? I was just walking to shul with my father, wow. but people would stop that they didn't say that. I remember one time reading in the newspaper that one in three Canadians holds anti Semitic views. And I remember thinking to myself, like, what do I need this for? Why? What do, like I didn't do anything. Why, why is this happening? And then there was one interaction which really bothered me. I was walking home from school one day. I was 13 years old. And a car pulled up at a red light. I was also waiting for the red light, but I was walking. And they rolled down the windows and someone yells out of the windows, Good Shabbos. It was a Thursday. And I said, you too. And there was a bunch of teenagers in the car. And then one of them did an extremely, made an extremely inappropriate and obscene gesture uh, towards me. 
And everyone burst out laughing and the car zoomed off. And I remember standing there and thinking, if I wasn't wearing this clothing, this wouldn't have happened. And at that moment, I, it really bothered me oh. that like my dress had contributed to this. And it's a very childish way of thinking of things because then I was like, well, listen, if I was dressed differently or if I was just like them, they wouldn't have bothered me. And then it brings me to an experience I had when I was in yeshiva. When I was 16 years old, I was learning in a yeshiva in Lakewood. Well, I should rephrase that. I was enrolled in a yeshiva in Lakewood. <laughs> there was not a lot of learning going on on my part. And it's good awareness. <laughs> yeah. And there was this, there was a, a rule, which was probably a very stupid rule in the yeshiva, that you had to be in yeshiva every Shabbos, but they didn't give you any meals. You had to find your own meals. A lot of kids lived in Lakewood, so it wasn't a big the room. deal. <laughs> like, figure it out. Yeah. So a lot of kids lived in Lakewood. It was no big deal for them. But for the out-of-towners, we had to figure this out every week. And the yeshiva had a couple families that they would place you at. But these were like very uptight, rigid families. You didn't feel like you were yourself. And there was this one family in Lakewood, the Malamud family, shout out. Um, the father's name is Yisrael. Maybe they called him Izzy. I don't remember. The mother was Devora. They called her Mama D. And this was this family where... Everyone felt comfortable, and a lot of boys who were struggling, like I was, went to this family on Shabbos, and it was just a place where everyone felt at home, at ease. I believe every town needs a place like this for people to hang out, and I hope that one day that will be my home because of what happened there. It was just a good place. You could always go for a cold drink or a hot meal, and one Friday night, it was there were probably 12, 15 boys sitting around the table in addition to the Malamud family, and it was a place where conversation just flowed freely. And Mr. Malamed says, boys, I have a question for you. I want to ask you guys a question. I don't want anyone to feel judged. I just want to ask you a question. I want everyone to answer. Honestly, don't answer right away. Just think about it. When you're ready, you're going to answer. He says, by a show of hands, how many of you, if you had a choice to be born Jewish or not Jewish, what would you choose? Who here would choose to be Jewish? People were looking around the room. What's everyone going to think? Almost no hands up, went up. Two wow. hands went up. One boy who I still remember who he is till today, his name is Shia Richter, and my hand went up too. Thank God I was one of them. The rest of the boys, they would rather be born not Jewish. And at that moment, I realized, like, we have a real problem. I don't know what contributes to it, but anti-Semitism is definitely a big part of it. When people feel like the way they dress and the way they identify is going to cause them harm in life, they say, why do I need this? I don't need this. This is, this is not worth it for me. Wow. I'm hated just because, I, just because I exist. And that's the crisis that we're going through right now. Because of October 7th, it's been exacerbated. And I felt that we have to do something to fight it. So I figured I would start a clothing line, which promotes... Can I stop pride. you for a moment before, sure. before back to present day? I'm so intrigued by this Malamed scene. It's, it, it's so ahead of its time. Yeah. For him to stop. I imagine this, this didn't happen recently. This, this was, was thir um, 13, 14 years ago. Yeah. Wow. Only two out of everyone sitting there. And did he proceed to, to talk about it? Did he invite everyone else to sort of share why? I'll like, be what honest happened with you, from I don't point? remember what happened afterwards. I wow. just remember that it left an impression on me that everyone sitting around the table, if they could have chosen differently, a lot of them would have. Right. And it bothered me and it's something I never, ever forgot. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. This, listen, this is something that, you know, obviously we'll get the present day, what you, what you started, but like when we went to Manhattan to, to sit down and interview people post October 7th, um, there were several Jews that were walking towards us and they, they put their hands in their pocket and took their yarmulke and put it back on their head and they sat down and off, off camera, I want, to put, I want to put them on the spot. You know, obviously on camera they wore their yarmulke, but like, when we wouldn't record, I'd say, I, I noticed you, you weren't wearing it, you know, when you were just walking. And they said, yeah, they're just, they're just worried. They're just scared. They're just, it, it just, it, it's the sort of lesson that you use where it's just like, it's not worth it. True. And I, I totally understand it. For me, it's harder because you see the way I dress. It's, it's a lot harder. It's a lot harder for me to disguise myself than other people. However, I feel that it's very important, and I'm talking to everybody here, especially the parents listening. What do you think your child is going to think when you leave the house and you take your yarmulke and you put it in your pocket? What kind of message are you sending to your child? The message you're sending to your child is, listen, yeah, we're Jewish, but it's a little uncomfortable, so we're just going to avoid it from nine to five or any time we leave the house. A child who sees that 
does not have a good chance of going on to lead a life where they're proud to be a Jew because they saw, even if this is not the message that the parents were trying to impart, but the message the child received was being Jewish is maybe something to be embarrassed of, something to be afraid of, something we don't, something we're not proud of, or something that's inconvenient, something that makes us unsafe, and that is a Jewish identity crisis. Where do you draw the line? Because like, you know, I, I know people who travel, and let's say they go to Arkansas or they go to more areas where really maybe it's not so safe for, for Jews. Um, it could be that you're saying now, and I, and I would agree with you, it's sort of like, you put on yarmulke. A yid is a yid. You're a yid there, you're a yid there. Where do, you, do you draw the line, though? Do you say, oh, listen, like there, like if you're traveling to Turkey, hide it. You know, what, what do you say? So that's a, that's a great question. And it specifically relates to me because I have traveled to places in the past where I had to yeah, disguise myself. It's not myself. a super hypothetical <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is something I deal with. <laughs> yeah. And what I've, I've pondered about this for a long time, and I've come to the conclusion that we just have to look into the Torah and see what halacha would say. If going out in the street with a yarmulke would put you in danger, I would think, and I'm not a rabbi, but I would think that halacha might require you to cover your head in some other way. However, if it's just uncomfortable, who said being a yid is all about being comfortable? You have to go out and you have to show the world that you're proud. And it's not about sticking it in the eyes of non-Jews. Oh, I'm a Jew and I'm proud. It's for us. It's to show us that we don't have to be afraid. And I mean, there's so much to say on this topic. There was something I wanted to say, but I forgot. I cut you off and I apologize. You were about to start talking about your clothing line. Yeah, no, well, well, the clothing line is not that important. We'll get to that. <laughs> no, in a I second. think it's pretty important. It's because it is, it is. No, it's the way you've I, crystallized. And also, it led to something pretty crazy that happened. Yeah. So, so let's go there for a second. And if I remember what I yeah. wanted to say, then we'll go back there. So, I went to Israel. And while I was in Israel, we, we made the first piece of clothing, which was this fist of solidarity. Um, it's been used by many organizations, a wide variety of political movements have used this from the BLM movement to Rameer Kahana to socialist, it goes back to Europe in the 1850s. It's a fist that represents struggle and um, the hardships that come with being members of certain communities. And I figured, let's wrap fill in around this fist. And I wasn't thinking so much about, like people see it as a sign of violence. It's near, that's really not what it was. What I was trying to show actually was the struggle of a man who has to put on tefillin every day. Some people wake up in the morning, they're all fired up, let's put on tefillin. Some people say, you know, I'll do it sometime throughout the day. And it's a struggle to put on tefillin every single day, no matter what. That was, that was what I was trying to symbolize. So we made this sweatshirt. I had one piece of it and I was flying to Florida and I figured, let me wear it on the plane. Why not? You know, let's, let's have some Jewish pride. I take the selfie. I upload it to Twitter and then, or X, whatever. I'm not, yeah. <laughs> not with the times. And when I land, I see that like it already had a few hundred thousand views and the comments that were coming in were, I can't even, I can't even describe without ruining your show how bad the comments were. Yeah. I'm used to getting hate comments. I get hate comments all the time. It's been happening for years. They really just slide off me. I don't, I don't care the slightest. A rabbi actually called me. He's like, I'm, I'm seeing what's happening on Twitter here. He's like, you know, if I got this kind of hate, I'd be in a psychiatric hospital. And I said, it doesn't, it really doesn't affect <laughs> me because thank God I've been in this space long enough that my self-worth is not pegged to what other people think about me, but I can understand why someone would be hurt and what does bother me about Good for comments, you, by the way. I want to amplify that point. Amplify it. No, because a lot of what we do and a lot of what goes on exists almost purely, strictly on social media. Yeah. That's where this exists. And it's so this. easy. Yeah, this that's happening right now as we speak. And it's so easy for something that someone says or something that someone does to just get out of control and get out into the, what's it called? The Twitter sphere? Yeah. Metaverse. That's still a thing? Metaverse? No, that, that's implying that there's Facebook involved. <laughs> it's more like the, 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 exo the exosphere. Or yeah. Something. And like it gets, it takes on its own life of its own and people start yelling and getting very caught up. And I, I know this is, this has happened to you in the past and it's, yeah. it's like really not push it. So for you to very casually and simply and confidently say, I don't derive my self-worth from what people say on social media. God bless you. Well, Thank what, you. what would your reaction be? I'm just curious. I don't know, honestly. I, I, I choose to not deal with it because I just don't participate. Yeah. 
Um, I don't know. I would definitely have to do a lot of work to get to where you are and to what you just said. So I'll be honest, I'm not perfect. There were three comments in my entire life that bothered me, and I know what they are. Two of them came in the year 2020, and one of them came last week. In 2020, at the beginning of COVID, someone wrote a comment on one of my YouTube videos. It was a YouTube video that I made with a good friend of mine, Mohammed Saud from Saudi Arabia, who's uh, currently in unknown circumstances. Yeah, they don't know. No one we don't, we don't know where he is, but he is a a pro Semite, a a lover of Jewish and people. He's just and off of the Israel. grid since October seventh. Since October third or fourth, he disappeared. Wow. But I went to Saudi Arabia. I spent some time with him, and I put this video online. And someone wrote a comment, and they said, "I hope you get COVID and die." And that was like the first week of COVID. And it was so scary because it was just scary. And I was like, why, why would someone write that? That hurt me. Another time, it was in the beginning of my YouTube career, someone wrote like, you don't have the spark. You're just, you're never going to make it. And I was trying so hard to be successful on YouTube. So that hurt me. I will admit that if I allowed it to hurt me, it means that I wasn't in a good space on my own, which is why it was able to penetrate. Otherwise it wouldn't have. But since then I've taken tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of nasty comments completely roll off me. Last week, someone wrote a comment that hurt me, and it wasn't about me personally. It was about Claudia Sorrell, and it hurt. And the comment was, I, I'm going to have to explain this because sure. it's evil to the next level. The comment was, I wish the Holocaust had happened. Oh, yeah. That hurts because, number one, he's wishing for all Jews to be eliminated, annihilated. Until he's number denied. two, he's denying the Holocaust, all in the same mm. message. And that hurt. And what also hurts is that another Jew like Nachi Gordon, might take a similar selfie and post it on the internet. And this person is getting dragged through the mud. Two point something million views on the selfie that Nachi posted, which was basically an imitation of what I did. You know about that? Well, no. Yeah. So basically, I, I, Shlemy did what he did. And then a, a bunch of other also people did the same thing on a plane, try to look Jewish. He posts a thing with the same, same if not you know, similar caption. And um, so I was coming back from Florida, going to Florida, and I posted it. And I just, just, uh, yeah, I tagged Shlaim even. I'm like, yeah. you know, two, 2.5 million people. The, the, the replies in the comments, such, such a, there's nothing proud about being a Jew. You're, you're a redhead. You're not even Jewish. You're probably Eastern European, Kazakhstan. Um, Khazars, yeah. Khazars. There's, there's so many conspiracy theories. And the crazy thing is that it's like, by the way, this is a way to trip the Twitter algorithm. All you got to do is post a selfie of yourself, like looking proudly Jewish and write the magic words, which you can copy from my tweet. And it's just going to go viral and people <laughs> will hate on you like no one's business. You expose oh, all yeah, the anti yeah. it's And it's, it's pretty wild. And what bothers me is that another Jew will post a picture of themselves online and they're going to get destroyed. And not everyone is used to this. And this can, this can hurt. It really could hurt someone. And it, it's, it's just so upsetting. Well, I'm happy that I amplified it because I didn't even know this must have happened recently. Now. Yeah, last uh, and the last week, I wow. didn't even realize. I, by the way, I turned my. It was it was a few hundred thousand before Shabbos, and then my brother Nissan, he's like, "Did you see the tweet?" I'm like, "No." I after Shabbos, I went back on Twitter, and it was at like two million, and and like it was pretty bad. It was a lot, a lot of Hitler stuff, and it was pretty bad. Yeah. Now, when it happened to me, uh, it was like I think it was December nineteenth. So what happened was it started going viral, and people started writing the nastiest things. They're talking about my appearance and my weight and my payas and this and that and whatever. And the, and the shirt, of course, they were knocking the shirt, which, by the way, made us sell a ton of shirts. <laughs> if, they, if they knew how much, how much business they were bringing to candle and a strap, they would, probably wouldn't have hated on me. But anyway, yeah. all this stuff was happening. And I was trying to figure out two things. Number one, why is it happening on a physical level? And why is it happening on a spiritual level? On a physical level, it makes no sense. It simply was anti-Semitism. Three or four days later... As this was going on, there was um, an actress. I don't think she's Jewish, but she noticed what's happening. She has a, quite a large following. And she just said, you know, I looked into Shlemy's timeline. He seems like a very nice person. And I can't believe that people are treating him this way. And then once she made that distinction, somebody went and dug up an old tweet of mine from 2019 when Hamas was shooting rockets at Israel. Israel was responding and... Israel, the, the IDF tweeted that um, Israel is responding to rocket fire from Gaza. And I wrote, I responded to that tweet with a tweet saying, there's going to be a bunch of brand new parking lots in Gaza today. And they took that to mean that I'm hoping for genocide of the Palestinians. When what I was simply doing was summarizing what happens every time Palestinians shoot rockets at Israel. Every time the Palestinians shoot rockets at Israel, Israel retaliates and 
by the way of that retaliation, new parking lots are made because they knocked down a bunch of buildings. Not me hoping for what's happening. It's simply right. me summarizing what is going to happen today. So they took that and then they tried to justify all the hate that I've been receiving for the last week on that tweet is because I'm a Zionist who supports the genocide of Palestinians. So they brought up this tweet to try to justify everything, which the tweet, no one found that tweet for a long time after the hate had started. So that was just, that's what's going on on a physical level. Simple anti-Semitism, person sees a Jew, they go nuts. But on a spiritual level, I couldn't figure out why this is happening. What, what was triggered here? And somebody sent me, this is fascinating, somebody sent me a Gemara in Masechtis Brachas. Rabbi Lazar Hagadol says, there's a Pasuk in Devarim, um, should I do this in Hasidic Havara or Litvish Havara? Hasidish, in very, yours. Very, very I, I'm a uh, Havara chameleon, so I can, I can go either way. Very comfortable. Okay. V'rui kolama yuretz ki shayim Hashem nikru aleichu v'yurayim imeku. The nations of the land will see that the name of God is called upon you and they will fear you. Says Rabbi Eliezer Agadol, this Pasuk is referring to Tefillin Shoresh. And when a non-Jewish person or a hater sees Tefillin, they are afraid. And that's what's happening. That's so interesting. There's a picture of Tefillin and people just lost their minds. And since then, I've been posting a picture of myself and Tefillin on Twitter every single day. Wow. And it's not to make people to stech their eyes out, as we're saying, it's not to make anybody feel bad or afraid. But since that day, the first day that I posted the picture, somebody sent me, somebody sent me a message and he says, you know, Shkio is coming up and I chanced upon your tweet and I remembered that I hadn't put on Tefillin today. So I'm put on Tefillin. And every single day since then, I've gotten messages from people who are putting on tefillin because they saw my reminder on Twitter. Wow. So it's like digital mivtoyim. I'm not it's there. Right? I'm not Yossi Farrow. I'm not running around putting tefillin mm -hmm. on people, but people mm -hmm. see the picture and they remember. On Erev Shabbos this week, right before Shabbos, I got a message from somebody who writes, I've been an atheist all my life, but I'm Jewish. And today I put on tefillin. Wow. We'll be right back to this episode. But first, a word from my friends at Town Appliance. You know, that noise your washing machine is making, the hissing sound the fridge is making, you know, maybe it's not supposed to be doing that. And it's time to upgrade your appliances. It's time to upgrade. Or maybe you just bought a new house and you're like, house is great, but we don't have a fridge. We don't have a washing machine. We don't have a washer and dryer. We need help. Who do we call? Bob the Builder. Who do you call after? You call townappliance.com. Or who even calls these days? Just send them a message on WhatsApp. How about that? Or go to townappliance.com if you're like super millennial. So Town Appliance is the number one place to go for all appliances. They've been number one since 1979. That is well before I was born, well before some of you were born. But they have been killing it in the appliance game. And it's time that you use Town Appliance for all your appliance needs. Hit the link in the show notes in the description of this episode and get in touch with Town Appliance today. And uh, the 10 minutes that you're probably waiting for townappliance.com, you're going to want to read a good book. So where are you going to get that good book? You're going to get it at Mosaic Press. And right now, there's this amazing offer. You buy $75 worth of books, and Mosaic is going to send you a gift. Okay, Mosaic has got some of the best titles. I personally think they have literally some of the best designed books in the world. You don't you really generally judge a book by its cover unless you're buying from Mosaic Press because they do a heck of a job when it comes to that. And then you open the book and read them, and it's incredible. One of my favorite books was done by Mosaic Press by Derek, but of Judah Michelle. So, so many amazing books. Go to mosaicapress.com. Go ahead and take advantage of this special offer right now. The link is in the show notes and description of this episode. Mosaicapress.com. This stuff has been, it's been pretty remarkable. Um, the spiritual movement that's been taking place, we're seeing it on social media. So, it's really the most unbelievable thing. Heads of, of of major the president of of Shopify, Shopify. Harley Finkelstein, yeah, you know Yessi Faragami put on Tefillin, the the guys from Morning Brew. We're talking about like major companies that that are, you know, dealing with tens of millions of of Americans, people in the world, and and it's like it's seeping, it's seeping. That it's, list of people that you just rattled off, they're putting on Tefillin. They, they yeah. yeah, they put wow. on Tefillin. But this is Tefillin. this is one of Michael the Rappaport, Michael Rappaport, who's a huge sports pundit, I guess you can call him. I never heard of him until after October he's 7th. He's like, a, you know, he's he, he's putting on Tefillin. Matis Yo, he's putting on Tefillin every day now. People who have left and people who have never come, you know, you and you said it, it makes the people scared who aren't for it, but 
for the people who are who have the neshama, it makes them love and it makes them come closer. So there's there's something. This is, if I may say, th- this is one beautiful outcome that has come from October seventh, is that people are coming home. And what does that mean? So there are so many organizations, outreach organizations, Jewish organizations that are trying to reach other Jewish people who are not affiliated or not super affiliated. They want to get them back into the fold to get them in touch with their Judaism. And one of the ways, you know, one of the things that they've all been struggling with for years in Chabad and Aish everywhere is how do you how do you reach someone? How do you get them? How do you how do you get inside them? How, how do, do you activate them? Yeah, how do you activate them? And it's hard because for a lot of people, Judaism is just something that it's a part of their DNA. Yes, I'm Jewish. My parents were Jewish. Some of them marry out. They're not into Torah and mitzvahs. That's not what talks to them. And so you can make a nice kiddush and maybe someone will come for a piece of kogel or gefilte fish or chalant. Some people say, okay, I prefer a cheeseburger. What do I need this for? How, do, how am I involved in this story? And then Hamas comes on October 7th. And you know a lot of people know this, a lot of people don't, but most of the areas that were affected on October 7th, in the south of Israel were, shall we say, very liberal areas where a lot of the people had a lot of sympathy with the Palestinians. These were people, it wasn't super religious areas. These were people who felt themselves part of the greater world, they weren't uh, necessarily very connected to Yiddishkeit. And Hamas comes to these areas and massacres 1,200 or 1,400 people, whatever the number is, they're still figuring it out. And they are saying death to Israel, death to the Jewish people, and we're going to take this into Fada. We're not just going to take it here in Israel, in the occupied territories. We're going to take it worldwide and every Jew will cower in fear. And all of a sudden, every single Yid on earth feels connected because they wanted to kill me. And the Pintaliyid came out. Everyone feels connected now because it's not about Chalant. It's not about whether you go to Shulan Shabbos or not, whether you go to Shulan Yom Kippur or not. It's they tried to kill me because I have this little Pintaliyid, this little Jewish spark inside me. And that touched every single Jew on the planet. And we're seeing the results of that, of people coming out of the woodwork. A guy who says, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. It doesn't mean that tomorrow he's going to you know, be a Shemr Shabbos. He's probably going to stay an atheist. But he's putting on tefillin because that touched him. Because his Jewish spark was activated. Kaval. Yeah. It's, I've spoken to many Chabad Shluchim and, and, and they said like, this is the most, this has been the easiest time they've ever had in terms of doing their, their Avaidah. People are coming to them. People are coming to them. We want to light candles. We want to put on film. We want to become more religious. We want to become more from. I think it's sort of like psychologically, it's like, you know, if you have brothers, like you could fight like cats and dogs at home with each other. And that's honestly what's been happening in the world prior to this, to this awful day. In Eretz Yisrael, the, on the brink of civil war, uh, you know, the, the religious, the not religious, even in America, there's so many different Hasidis and this lit fish and this and that. And we could, we, could, we could fight with each other. And it's fine. We're siblings. We could. But you don't mess with my sibling. If you go to school and someone else is bullying your sibling, you're fighting together and you're coming, you're coming together. And that's what we're seeing in the world. And Mr. Shemesh should continue. Yeah. should continue. And I think what you're doing and, and what we, we should you know, talk about more and how it, how it can grow and grow is, is, is to wear that on your sleeve. Is that if you're on a flight, if you're in an airport, if you're, if you're on vacation, no matter where you are in the world, you don't, you do not hide it. You do not hide it. We're done hiding. It's not just about we're done hiding. It's dangerous to hide. If you're hiding, then you're teaching your children a lesson that cannot be unlearned. And I would assume and I would imagine that people who are listening to this want their children to be proud Jews. You've got to be very careful with your subtle messaging, the, not, not the verbal stuff you're saying, the stuff you're showing them. How do you act when you leave the house? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I, I want to tell you something. I was in Dubai a couple years ago for Pesach. So I was invited to speak at a Pesach program, and it was Shabbos Hagadol, and we're sitting with Chabad in this big ballroom. There were probably three hundred people in the room Friday night. We're Duchman with Duchman, and um, a guy walks into the room, an older man, probably in his seventies, possibly even eighty years old, with a bunch of his grandchildren. They walk in, and eventually, I don't know, one of his grandchildren noticed that I was there. And they came to our table to say hi. And the grandfather introduces me to his grandchildren. He, he didn't know, you know what I do, but his grandchildren knew they wanted to meet me. So we're talking to them. And all of a sudden, I noticed they're all wearing baseball caps. And I, I probably should not have done this, but I looked at the grandfather, and he was wearing a baseball cap. He was wearing a baseball cap too. And I said, 
sir, I'm, I'm disappointed in you. And he said, what do you, what do you mean? And I said, you're in Dubai. This country has, this, where the United Arab Emirates has made peace with Israel. It's safe, completely safe. I walk around with my strimal, my bagshim, my talus, no issues. In fact, people were so nice, they would come over and say, shalom. You're here with your grandchildren. You're all Jews. You're all behaving nicely, but you're covering up the fact that you're Jewish. So what happens? You're in a country that has 200, 200 different nationalities here. People from every corner of the world are walking around. And for many, if not most of them, it's going to be the first time they see a Jew in their entire lives. And you have an opportunity to show them that Jews are nice. Jews are not baby killers. The Jews smile. They have manners and they tip nicely and they're just good people. And you're, you're squandering the opportunity because you're wearing a baseball cap because you don't want to feel uncomfortable. And he looks at me. He did not seem to be impressed. And he said, good Shabbos. And they all walked away. I remember turning to my wife and saying, I, I don't think I should have said that. That man's old enough to be my grandfather. What a good <laughs> I am. End of story. All night it bothered me. The next morning by Shachris, the man walks in with his grandchildren, comes right up to me, says, I want you to know something. We left our baseball caps in the hotel. Mm -hmm. You were right. It's not just that you're hiding the fact that you're Jewish and your kids are going to see that you're not proud to be Jewish and that's going to affect them. But what about the world? You're losing your, visibil you're, you're, you're losing your visibility in a time when the Jewish people are being attacked and the entire world is calling us murderers and baby killers and occupiers and apartheid. Uh, you have an opportunity to walk around and show the world that you're a nice, normal, healthy, happy human being. When you hide that, you lose that opportunity. It's not just about what we think and how we see ourselves. It's about how they see us too. And guess what the anti-Semites love the most? Scaring Jews into hiding. So for that reason as well, you cannot hide. If you're in a place where, God forbid, it would be dangerous, halacha would require you to hide. But America is not like that. For the most part, you can go anywhere in America dressed proudly as a Jew. It might be now, uncomfortable, but not dangerous. It might be dangerous. uncomfortable, but not dangerous. Now, I should say, I live in Texas, okay? Um, there is quite a low rate of anti-Semitism in Texas. And to further, I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but if... While well, everything is bigger in Texas, everything's not anti-Semitism. Not anti-Semitism, and because also... Because there are other things... There are other things... That are bigger And And uh, if somebody starts up with uh, a member of the Jewish community in Texas, there's quite a good chance they're going to be driven away from that scene in a body bag. So it's easy for me to say this to Jews who live in New York and California, elsewhere where it's harder to, to carry something to protect you. But for the most part, I don't think America is in this place yet where it's dangerous to walk around as a Jew. Uncomfortable? 100%. Dangerous? No. And it applies not even... You, listen, not everyone's going to Dubai. It's about to be midwinter vacation, to be honest. Mm -hmm. People are traveling all over the world. And you, you could be even going as, somewhere as a, as a mall, a major mall, or Six Flags. Or if you're in Florida, you're going to Disney. Like, don't, don't wear that hat there. Like, you know? What do you think, Momo? Yeah, listen, I, I, I understand where people are coming from, and I also understand exactly what you're offering them. And if a person is able to tap in, for lack of a better term, to tap into their Jewishness, and they can sense their chelik alakami mal mamish, and they can know that they are a piece of godliness living in this world, and that's what makes them a Jew then yes, then that is what empowers them to know that there's nothing to be afraid of. And I think the part of what you're saying that resonates with me the most is that we signal so much to everyone that we have influence on. You mentioned children. Ourselves. We influence ourselves so much by our own behavior more than what even intellectually we tell ourselves. So even if we tell ourselves, I am proud to be a Jew, but we deprive ourselves of the discomfort of actually living by that reality sometimes the discomfort we influence ourselves when we when we fail to do that and if we're, if we're able to grab onto the example that you're living and to indeed be proud and to wear it with pride and to live it with pride then gewalt then uh ashrecha when i was a kid i was my parents lived in an apartment building and i remember once i was getting into the elevator and a woman stopped me. I was probably like 10 years old, a non-Jewish woman. And she says, uh, young man, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. And she says, what are these things that you have on the side of your head? 
I started explaining to her that the Torah says that you shouldn't cut off the sides of your, you know, your hair. It's a commandment in the Bible, and this is a Jewish thing. And you know, a lot of people have smaller uh, side locks, or but you know, in the Hasidic community, we, we say this is what this is what we believe. Ze kaili van vai. This is my God. I'm going to beautify it. So not that Peis is your God, but for Hashem, right. you make everything beautiful. So you have the nicest sukkah and the nicest becher and the, everything for Hashem. So Peis, you go all the way. You grow you grow up here. So, so this lady says to me, she's like, wow, that's beautiful. I, I, I think you should be so proud of your heritage. Do you realize that for thousands of years, people have been trying to destroy your people and you walking around like this, keeping in, in touch with your traditions? That's so beautiful. You should be so proud of yourself. And that was the moment, I think, that like, boom, I was like, I'm going to live this. I'm Jewish anyway. There's nothing I can do about that. Let me, let me live it. Let me be a Yid. Let me go around and be happy and proud of who I am, comfortable in my own skin, and try to spread that to other people. And that wa- that's why when I was sitting by the Malamad Shamas table, which was a couple years later, and this happened, I was like, it bothered me. Like, what, what is it that, that, that people are so afraid of or so uncomfortable with? Own it. You're a Jew. God chose you. And I'm, not, I'm uncomfortable with saying, you know, the Jewish people are better or higher because that, that leads to like supremacy. And I'm uncomfortable when other people from other groups do it. So I like to think that the chosen people means that Hashem chose us to have more responsibility to shine light into this world. I don't think I'm better than anyone, but I have more responsibility. Own that responsibility. Take it into your two hands. Go out there and be the shiniest, fanciest, happiest, brightest year that you can be. Kval. It's absolutely, right? Yeah, no, I, I, I was talking to Ray Barrel Lazar. I was in the oil, and uh, I bumped into him, and I was asking a bunch of Chabad Rabbanim, what are you telling kids on campus who are experiencing anti-Semitism? Because they're really, honestly, they're, they're getting the brunt of it. Like UCLA, USC, Harvard, MIT. They're, it's, it's crazy. Penn, Penn yeah. Um, where would you go, Penn? How are you? You good? I was going to go to Penn, but I... I didn't like them. She wasn't the president when I was there. No? For the record. I threw out my scholarship from Harvard recently. Really? Yeah. Just Are you serious? Disgusted with them. <laughs> 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 uh, but but I do like to say now, I'm like, this is why I didn't go to Harvard. This yeah. Is why, this is why. That's why I never ate Bed and Jerry's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but Ray Barrel is our, I asked him about, you know, people are, what are you going to tell the kid who might be putting away them as a, Hiding the tzitzis, hiding the yamka. He said, when you hide those things, it's like a shark that tastes blood. They, they taste your fear and they go for the kill. But if you wear it proudly, they're going to be scared. They're not scared like, oh, you're scaring me. They're not going to mess. There's nothing. That, who, who, who am I quoting? Who said this? Ah, there's a, there's a, a serious. So far, no one. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, mama. <laughs> Um, there's a there's a quote about ah someone's it's coming it's coming about in. Jews no about a Jews. Jew related quote yes a Jew related quote have a lot of fun is with it Mark Twain <laughs> maybe no what, like what's the context the con the, the quote was something along we have very little to go off right now <laughs> <laughs> honestly I mean when I was a kid I heard a quote dirty Jew <laughs> that, that, it's like what what is your you are know, being so nice. You know, like they were playing Guess Who. Like he has a mustache. Uh, <laughs> Jeff, nope. Max, <laughs> nope. Um, it, like, there's. N- <sighs> What's the best type of Jew? <laughs> <laughs> you have my phone. I don't a even Jew know. Jew is not afraid. Yeah, something like that. I don't know. No, you just yeah, but but basically, Jews respect Jews who love their judaism and non-jews respect jews who love their judaism this is a crazy this is taking it to a crazy level one year in rosh hashanah in uman i spent i i shared an apartment with this guy named aaron granot aaron granovich he was a reporter a Haredi reporter who had traveled all over the world and at one point he ended up in iraq and he's walking around iraq dressed like a gera chassid and i asked him like how like what are you thinking and he said to me words that i will never forget he said, when somebody sees how comfortable you are in your own skin, that you're walking around like a boss and you're not afraid of anyone, they are afraid of you. Mm. Yeah. I always told this to my campers in camp, how are you, camp monk? 
I said, when, like it used to be illegal to order food at, like at night. Kids would want to order duggies. I think duggies now, combo platter. Yeah, I think now it's like you're allowed to. I don't know. Erroneous, really erroneous behaviors. Yeah, I don't know. We'll have to. Find. That's a big change. I know, but it used are to you be, sure about that? I'm pretty sure that's what they're telling me. Wait. Yep. Yep. They're telling me that. <laughs> pretty sure. And it used to be illegal. So I used to like tell the my campers like, listen, if you're gonna order, at least like know how to how to do it. You get the you pick up the food, and if you're gonna try running and hiding, something's gonna you're gonna look like you're you're doing something wrong. You hold that bag and you walk straight up the middle of the camp, and one of their main will be side. like, "Oh, he must have a sim or something, and he he got permission." You you when you look like you when you walk like you belong, you act. Like, the guy snuck into the Super Bowl. How do you do it? There's a guy who snuck into the Super Bowl, right? You didn't have a ticket. How do you do it? He didn't sneak through scaffolding stuff. He walked in, like... Walked up to the 50-yard line. Yeah, like, I'm literally a player. Like, excuse me. And they're like, oh, yeah. The confidence that you exude, it, it is contagious. Everyone sees it, and it's a game changer. Yeah. And that's my TED Talk. <laughs> Sneak into Super Bowl this year. Um, anything else you want to add for me? So let's let's talk about Candle and Strap first. Yes, Candle and Strap. So this Candle is the new strap. brand. This is the new clothing brand. I made merch that is intended to promote Jewish pride. But what is Jewish pride? It's not just looking visibly Jewish, identifying publicly as Jewish. It's also about doing mitzvahs. Because what, what are you proud of? You have to be proud of the heritage that we have that was passed down from father to son, mother to daughter for thousands of years. And the designs that I make promote um, Jewish pride, Torah mitzvahs, the name itself, candle and strap candle, represents Shabbos candles that women light on Shabbos or before Shabbos. And strap is for the tefillin every morning we get strapped. And I made these designs, which is what triggered the whole viral tweet. And the idea is to try to get people to be proud that they're Jewish, loud and proud. If you're not the kind of guy who wears a huge yarmulke or long pace, or you grow yourself a long beard, or you walk around with a talus in the street, if you want to show the world that you're actually out there and proud, buy something or wear something. It doesn't have to be for my brand. Wear something that has Jewish visibility on it. A mug and David, a high necklace, anything that shows that you are Jewish. And... I wouldn't mind if people purchased from this brand. I actually sure. brought you guys some stuff. Thank, okay. you. Thank you. We have Let's new, check it out. Let's yeah, see so, okay. What's up? So first of all, I want to show you this. Oh, what is that? This is a hoodie that I made. Oh, it's red. It's red. Oh, Ken Bone, how are last, you? Ken Bone, Shlemmy Zions, how are you? <laughs> last time I came- Who wore it first? I, he wore it first, <laughs> but I liked it since I was a little kid. I just didn't have the confidence. I wasn't owning up to my redness. Yeah. And then I became proud red, and now I just wear it everywhere. Last <laughs> time I was on the podcast, I got a call the night before- the episode, I was told, don't even think of showing up without that red sweater. Like, yeah. don't. So that's what happened. Okay, so this is a hoodie I made. It has candle and strap on the back. Nice. And in the front, it has one little dot. What does it say in there? Yid. Yid. It's the pintle yid. The... Right over There's there. nothing else right there. The heart. Just the pintle yid. Fire. Okay. Now, I got something for you guys. This is for Oh, nice. This is for Momo. I want you Thank guys to you. open them up. Oh, let's um, do this. Mine has food. I'm already loving it. So I was listening to an episode of Meaningful People. And one of the, there was a guest, or Kana Shmatkin. Yeah. And he was talking about something. And Momo says the term, hey, like YOLO. And I just hey, loved like it so much. Oh my so God. We, we made you a hey, like YOLO Thank sh you. Uh, sweatshirt. And it has a little strimal action on top. Wow. If you see. And then Nahi, in the same episode, was talking about what Rebel Kana did, and he, said he, was, he was spreading the light of Lubavitcher Rebbe, and Nahi really said, spreading it like cream cheese. <laughs> I thought, that's such a cool line. So, spread it like cream cheese, Spread baby. it like cream cheese. So, Hashtag laughter. It's so funny, because this is like a year ago. I remember sitting in the car, I was listening to the episode, and I'm Whoa. like, you know what? Next time I see them, I'm going to bring them merch that has these lines on it. This is way before October 7th, way before Candle and Strap, way before the Jewish wow. identity crisis, but I made up in my mind that I'm going to bring this to you guys. Dude, it's and fire. Now, you have to wear this on your next wear. flight, also. It's like, legit fire. Hey, look, Yolo. I, I remember that conversation. Yolo. Yolo. It Not was, yo yo. We, we, maybe hey, we get a Hey, look, Yolo too. We no, put a Star of David on it. It was for Yankee Samet. It's Yankee Samet's line. Oh. He oh, I'm says, sorry. Is, he's there a a is there a copyright issue? No, no. He's, <laughs> he's a Hey, look, Yid. He's living Yolo, legit. He wow. is constantly looking for ways to help Yidden with like information, whatever you need. He's okay. like, Mom is there. And like I once said to him, just like, oh, I'm like in the middle of putting it on. <laughs> Can you help him? This is the right size. Peekaboo. Thank wow. you. Wow. Hey, look at YOLO. I love it. 
That's awesome. That is so awesome. You said uh, it was Yankee Summit? Yankee Summit, yeah. So he goes, so I was just commenting to him. I was like, wow, like you're momish, like you're so ibergegeben, like you're so selfless in helping people. I'm translating. <laughs> Ibergegeben? <laughs> Ibergegeben, which means like you're given over, like you're selflessly there for other people. There's no word for it in English. Certain it's, things are just... <laughs> Ibergegeben. Next Ibergegeben. sweatshirt's Ibergegeben. And <laughs> Not a bad idea. Basically, he was like, yeah, YOLO. Hey, look at YOLO. He just said to me, he's like, yeah, hey, look at YOLO. YOLO. Does he wear a strimal? Amazing. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. So it says, um, Dover b'shem Amrei. Maybe Gula Lailam. So thank you, Yankee Samet. We just brought the Gula a little bit closer. We found that Machir, you're gonna put it on? Uh, yeah. I'm gonna I, put on my Yid one also. Spreading it like cream cheese, baby. Spreading it like cream cheese. J and J, how are you? <laughs> Philadelphia cream cheese. Oh my gosh, this is awesome. First of all, we're gonna have to get these pictures all Thank you English. so much, Lima. Seriously, you really look you're the best person I've ever seen in red. Thank you. Better than Santa? Yeah, no, better than Santa. Okay, great. I, I hope you don't see any like bull. Like when you're walking outside, because other people see it and they get very triggered, very right deep. <laughs> hey, Ligiolo, dude. Yeah, I'm feeling so good. So we're not done. Yeah. One of the things that I think it's time for us to talk about, Nachi. I don't okay. even know if Momo knows this, but Nachi uh -oh. knows, is that we are actually working on a meaningful minute X candle and strap collaboration. Interesting. So when this episode goes live, yeah. There's going to be on the candle and strap website. Shameless plug: candleandstrap.com. <laughs> You go to the website, and there's going to be a collection of Meaningful Minute-inspired designs on our website. We're going to be selling them together. Part of the proceeds will go to Meaningful Minute, and part of the proceeds will go to United Hatzalah to support wow. life-saving in Israel. What do you think it should be, Momo? What should it be? What yeah. should what be? What, what, should the, what should the design be? What should, what should our, our thing be? Well, these two are definitely in. Spreading like cream cheese and Hey Ligiolo, hey, for sure. Hey Ligiolo. I love it. So people could buy spreading it like cream cheese. Yeah. And people could buy Hey, hey Ligicity. I get or, a lot of feedback on Hey Ligicity. That's yeah. a good one. Hey Ligicity. I like Hey Ligicity. Or you could just buy cream cheese. Yeah. And spread it like without <laughs> the shirt. Yeah. I love that. Or too. you could spread cream cheese on is the shirt. Is this one also going to be for sale? <laughs> yes. This one is not on the site yet, but it's a new design that I, I think I this is going to be my favorite. Yeah. yeah. And the designer said he thinks this is going to be like a big hit. What it's a, yeah. literally, it's, it's the Pintalayid. Okay. So that everyone should know that. You're going to go on Candle and Strap when you're listening to this website, listening to this episode. And there's going to be a nice collab between Meaningful Minute and Candle and Strap. You're going to be able to buy Hey Like a Yolo, spread it like cream cheese, hashtag we're lactose intolerant because we're Jewish. And um, maybe other ones, maybe others. So yeah, we're aiming for like eight to ten designs. Amazing! Oh my gosh, this fire! Hit. That's awesome. Candleandstrap.com. Shlomi, it's so nice to get back together with you over here to Likewise. speak with you. You're doing such holy work, and uh, don't let, don't ever let any hateful comment in the world distinguish even a little bit of the fire that you have, because um, you know I would say you don't have. I would say you have no idea. The impact you're having but i think you, you're quite literally able to see it on a daily basis what happens and beyond that what you don't see obviously so just continue doing your holy work and the mirza shem the light of mashiach will come out through all this uh all through all the savaida really and we're gonna spread it everywhere like cream cheese exactly <laughs> exactly gewalt gewalt thank you so much thank you guys you just watched this episode and you love it and you saw that merch we put on at the end it is fire and you can get it at candleandstrap.com we have a meaningful minute slash meaningful people lined of merch that just came out with candle and strap. So head to the website, candleandstrap.com, get the Hala Gissity, uh sweatshirt or the 1440 because it's 1,440 minutes in every single day and we make every single one of them count and walk around proud to be a Jew wearing candle and strap. Of course, leave a comment, subscribe to our channel and, and like this video and we will be giving away some of that merch to you, one lucky winner to be announced on next week's episode. Um, if you want some more content from Meaningful Minute, Meaningful People, you're going to want to join Meaningful Minute Plus. So go to the show notes in the description of this episode where you'll see all of our sponsors who make this possible. You're going to see that link to join our WhatsApp group. It is free to join and we have a lot more conversations with a lot of these guests that you see here on Meaningful People. We talk to them uh, sort of like a Patreon type version, but it's free. So come join Meaningful Minute Plus. Get your gear from candleandstrap.com. Thank you so much for being a listener, a subscriber a follower, a friend here at Meaningful People. And I can't wait to see you again next week. Bye-bye.